Let me set the scene here. You're dead. Okay, you are in the afterlife and you have the chance to redeem yourself and get a second chance at life, or you wander for eternity in hell. What do you do? Would you want to do this whole life thing again? And if not, would you take the risk and stay in the afterlife? Because let's face it, everyone says hell is this big scary underworld, but no one's exactly come back to confirm whether or not that's true. It's a bit of a gloomy predicament for sure, but an interesting one, isn't it? The afterlife and just in general what comes after death is not one I see explored very often in the gaming world. Sure, you have games set in hell, like Doom for example, but that game's just about shooting up demons and causing chaos, which is very cool mind you, but wouldn't it also be cool to see a game where you explore hell in detail, a more serious approach really, where you'll ultimately be faced with the question, are you ready to move on to the afterlife? This is exactly the dilemma that you face when you play Hungry Ghosts, a 2003 survival horror for the PlayStation 2 developed by Deep Space. If you've never heard of this company before, then I can't really blame you. They only ever managed to release two games before going out of business, only one of which was even localized at all, Extermination, which released in 2001. Even if you're not familiar with Deep Space, I can guarantee you you're familiar with its founder, Tokuro Fujiwara, or at least the games he worked on. Before setting up Deep Space, Fujiwara worked at Capcom for 13 years throughout the 80s and 90s. During his time at Capcom, he was the director of countless classics like Bionic Commando, Ghosts and Goblins, and Sweet Home, the game that served as the biggest inspiration for Resident Evil. He also worked on Resident Evil, produced a large majority of the OG Mega Man games, and now for a complete tonal shift, he directed Tomba. <laughs> Truly a man of many talents, and it's honestly a shame his name is not more well known given his catalogue. So anyway, in 1998, Fujiwara left Capcom and set up Deep Space, and while their first release, Extermination, was a more traditional Resident Evil-esque survival horror, Hungry Ghost was definitely the more experimental title. The genre of survival horror doesn't even really feel appropriate. It's more like a first-person immersive sim exploring hell. There's not a heavy focus on item management or puzzles that you might expect from a survival horror, but there is the combat and overall spooky atmosphere. It seems even the developers knew that it didn't really fit into any traditional genres either, because the subheading on the box describes it as a pseudo-afterlife simulation adventure or something along those lines. Where do people go when they die? What's the afterlife like? What if you could experience something like it? They're definitely amping up the whole real experience aspect to it. You know, I realize a lot of us Western folk probably aren't very familiar with Japanese game boxes. A lot of games in this era had this massive red symbol on it that just says, this game contains scenes of explosive violence and gore, you know, not unlike those screens you'd see when you boot up an old Resident Evil or Silent Hill. And it's interesting seeing Cero 18 on this box. The Cero age rating system in Japan got a bit of an overhaul a few years after this, where instead of age ratings like this, they went with a letter-based system. Cero A, B, C, D, and Z, with Z being the equivalent of an 18 rating. Japan in general is way more picky when it comes to gore and horror in their games. I mean, look at the PS5 cover for Resident Evil Village, for example. All of these symbols are just to remind you that the game is an 18 plus title. It's a pretty wild rabbit hole to go down, but hey, maybe that's a discussion for another video. As soon as the game starts, we see our protagonist lost in a forest, wondering how they ended up there. A strange light leads them to a massive door, and passing through this, they find themselves on a foggy pier. After boarding one of the small boats, a mysterious hooded man appears behind us, telling us that crossing this river will bring us to the village of the dead, or simply hell. He explains that everyone who dies finds themselves here in this strange purgatory before eventually arriving at the Gates of Judgment. We were a warrior in a previous life, and as such have killed many people, so in our case we're destined to walk for eternity in hell. But there is something we can do that might change this. Depending on our actions from here on out, we may have a chance at redemption. On our way to the Gates of Judgment, how we navigate the underworld, how we choose to interact with the village of the dead and the spirits that reside within it, may give us a second chance at life, a reincarnation. This, of course, is somewhat of a dangerous task. I mean, this entire place is basically Hell's waiting room, after all, and a lot of people just go straight to the Gates of Judgment and accept their fate. But on the flip side, if we were to do that, then our eternity in Hell is practically guaranteed, so... You know, pick your poison. Shinpan 
それだけなら地獄へと向かうお前の運命は変わらんおそらくな Some people might have noticed hey, this whole ferryman on a boat leading us to hell thing is really similar to the River Styx. And while this is a fair comparison, the idea of crossing a river to hell is not actually that unique to Greek mythology. Similar concepts exist in Chinese mythology as well as Hinduism. But in Japan's case, the river that leads on to the afterlife is called Sanzu no Kawa, or Sanzu River. And Hungry Ghost makes a lot of nods to not only Japanese and Buddhist beliefs, but Western concepts of the afterlife as well, which I'll delve into a little bit later. But either way, It is cool as hell. Anyway, once we make it to the other side, we get our first taste of gameplay. Hungry Ghost, like I said, is a first person, exploration focused survival horror. If you've ever played Kingsfield, you already know what to expect. You roam around big open spaces, attack enemies, and pick up any goodies you find along the way. The areas are incredibly detailed, and there are dozens of tiny nooks and crannies to find all around any given space. The golden rule in Hungry Ghost, though, is you can interact with virtually everything in this game. More or less any time you see this reticule change color, it means whatever you're zoned in on right now is interactable. Tiny talking skull in the wall? Yep, you can probably break it, but maybe try speaking to it first and it'll tell you something useful. A small well? If you manage to find a handle for it, then you can pull up whatever may be down there. Even all the skulls around the place have something to say should you interact with them, but equally, you can just go ahead and kill them. Well, you know, kill off an already dead thing. And they might instead drop something of use. And that is the core of Hungry Ghost gameplay complete and total freedom to interact with the village of the dead however you please. The ferryman told us that collecting so called spirit fragments will help us on our journey, but besides that, everything between now and the gates of judgment is free game. Be a total tyrant and kill everything in your way, or avoid combat entirely. Clean out every area of items, notes, and weapons, or just stick with your basic starting gear. Engage with subplots and other characters, or just rush through to the next area. This emphasis on decision making starts before you even begin the game, where you have to decide on a name and gender of your character. An option that Fujiwara intentionally included for the sake of immersion, saying, if a woman was playing as a male character, for example, it would be hard for them to feel as immersed in the world. And of course, if a woman who knew deep down they are a man was playing the game, they can experience it as a man, and vice versa. Damn, Hunger Ghost really said trans rights. But the point is, every choice is yours to make. But your actions don't come without a cost because everything you do and don't do can impact what ending you get. But hey, let's not get too ahead of ourselves just yet. Let's talk a little bit more about the gameplay. Movement and just generally navigating the world definitely takes a while to get used to, and it'll probably be the first thing you notice once you get started. The left stick makes you go forward, back, left, and right as you may expect, but to look around, you need to hold L1 and then move the left stick. And, you know, why the hell not use the right stick like every other game ever? Well, that's because the right stick is for combat instead. Yeah, a little weird, isn't it? You start off with just a basic spear and crossbow, and taking the spear as an example, you can do a quick jab by pushing the right stick forward, or you can do a stronger, more charged up attack by holding back the right stick for a few seconds and then pushing forward. Or, for example, with the crossbow, you hold back on the right stick to load up the arrow and then let go to send it flying. And while this kind of control scheme can be a bit cumbersome and a lot to wrap your head around at times, I gotta give it credit, it makes the combat feel way more immersive. It feels like you are doing the attacks yourself to a certain degree, or, you know, at least the motions of it. I mean, in other games, you just press square or press X and the characters will just do the attack for you, but here, you have to replicate the physical motion of the attack or else it won't happen. The controller inputs were designed to make you feel more involved with the battle, and together with the first person camera perspective, it can make fun. Fighting off goals way more thrilling. You feel like you're right there. You're not playing as a character battling the way through hell, you yourself are battling through hell. If you ever want to go the extra mile, turn on atmospheric mode in the options menu to completely get rid of the HUD. It makes things harder for sure, but definitely creates an even more immersive experience. Similar mechanics exist for when you interact with your environments as well. Sometimes your spear will get lodged in a barrel and you gotta wiggle the stick to get it back out, for example. Or when picking up items, you gotta hold the right stick forward as your character slowly outstretches their hand, sometimes having to pull back when a ghoul might attack. It was kind of not seeing this because the only other time I've seen a game do this are the later Fatal Frame games, but those came out years after this game. I wonder if the Fatal Frame devs took inspiration from Hungry Ghost because it is a pretty unique mechanic. 
I'd be lying if I said it doesn't get a bit tiring though. I get what they were going for, you know, it constantly keeps you on your toes and it definitely wakes you up if your mind was on autopilot, but it genuinely turns every single item pickup into a five or six second affair, which doesn't sound that bad when I put it like that, but it really can add up, especially in rooms where there's a lot of things to find. And it's not just items, mind you. Every time you open a door, every time you're putting something down, all of these are the same. So it could be very off-putting to the more impatient players. Very cool concept, somewhat flawed in execution, but personally, it didn't really hinder the journey all that much. I just got used to it. As for what items you'll be picking up, there's quite a few. Your inventory is split up into three different categories. Weapons, equipable items, and usable items. Weapons are, well, pretty straightforward. You can find stronger versions of your spear and crossbow during the game, but those are the only weapon types you'll ever get. There's no guns or shotguns or anything like that here. Equipable items cover a lot of ground. There's some secondary weapons like small daggers you can use to throw at the enemy. There's holy water that you can use to ward off certain ghosts, or matches that you can use to light up darker areas. Areas. Usable items then are mainly things like keys, healing items, or protection items that can deflect curses. Food serves as the healing items, all with varying levels of efficiency, but some can also double as projectiles as well. Some ghosts hate the smell of certain fruit or food, for example, and it'll stun them or make them cower if you throw it at them, and I really like the flexibility of this. Having items that can both help you and hinder the enemy depending on how you want to use it. You're also encouraged to think a little bit outside the box as well. Experimentation is the key to getting the most out of your playthrough, and figuring out what to do in your own feels so much more fulfilling because of it, especially because there is no hand-holding to be found here. You are very much thrown into the deep end in this game. Health also works a little bit differently in Hungry Ghosts. You might have noticed both a spirit meter and a vitality meter up at the top. Your vitality is your actual health, whereas spirit is effectively a shield. Both will be willed down when you take hits, but when your spirit meter is completely emptied, you are a lot more susceptible to attacks, meaning your health bar will go down twice as fast as before. It's a lot like the armor system in Doom, actually. Both meters go down when you take a hit, but once one is gone, the other will plummet a lot faster. Thankfully, most healing items replenish both your spirit and vitality equally, and as you progress through the game, the spirit meter automatically gets upgraded as enemies get tougher. And speaking of enemies, starting off you'll mostly be encountering ghouls. They're the bog standard ghost enemies and will swipe at you when they get too close. They can actually steal items from you as well if they manage to latch onto you, which you'll only be able to get back once you kill them. You know, again, kill an already dead thing. They're fairly easy to deal with and serve as the basic enemy variety in the game, and while you might get used to them after a while, I can't deny that seeing them slowly approaching you from a distance, their glowing eyes as they creep towards you, oof, it can be goddamn chilling. You'll eventually meet ghosts as well, and okay, yeah, I know, these guys are also ghosts, kind of the same thing to most people. Well, that's the fun part of playing a game in Japanese, a language where they have like 50 different ways of saying ghosts, and in English we've got like two. Okay, so I'm running out of words here, but these guys are ghouls and these guys are ghosts. Anyway, Ghosts are without a doubt way more terrifying than ghouls though. I mean, <laughs> for starters, Jesus, look at that thing. But they're also much stronger, much more aggressive enemies that you'll want to avoid at all costs. These guys are pretty beefy and can completely wipe you out of arrows and healing. They're practically mini bosses <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Sometimes they'll stop fighting and try to strike up a deal with you, saying they'll leave you alone for now if you offer up some of your items. But sometimes they don't like what you offer up and will keep fighting you regardless, so I just didn't bother bargaining with them. It was never worth potentially losing good items. There are some secondary enemies as well, like crows, which will fly and peck at you if you get too close, and curses, which can afflict you with a whole ton of debuffs. They can make you run slower, they can restrict your vision, some of them straight up stop you from using keys. They are a massive hindrance, so it's always best to heal up ASAP if you get one of them. But probably the coolest enemy concept, in my opinion, are the Shinigami, a word you might remember from that really niche anime. I don't know, you've probably never heard of it. Shinigami means God of Death, or a more familiar to us Western folk would be the name Grim Reaper, and they start to show up in the second half of Hungry Ghosts. Rather than just attacking you head-on like all the other enemies though, these guys will instead teleport around the room and try to sneak in hits using their scythe. And you'd better be playing on a good TV or with headphones, because the only way to predict where they'll show up next is by their taunts. If you're on the ball, then these encounters are actually fairly straightforward. 
Predict where they're coming from, shoot them with your crossbow, rinse and repeat. But if you happen to take a hit, you'll notice something a little unusual. A warning shows up on screen every time its scythe hits you. Once, twice, and after the third hit, you're teleported to a strange, unfamiliar place. This area is called the Graveyard to Hell, and depending on how you play, you might never even find this on your playthrough. There's only two ways you can end up in the graveyard. Three hits from a Grim Reaper, or by falling down here by complete accident. And once you're down here, you're stuck until you find a way back to the village of the dead. On my first playthrough, I actually found myself in the graveyard very quickly and it really took me off guard. The red, aggressive colors, the weird enemies you only ever find down here, all the headstones littered around the place. Just as I started to get comfortable with the game and how it worked, it threw yet another curveball at me and landed me in a place that somehow felt even more threatening and malicious than the hell I was already in. Once again, another great example of how there are so many branching paths and hungry goals that truly make it feel like a real fleshed out living and breathing underworld. And this vision really shines when you interact with those who live in the village of the dead. Stray spirits, or as the game manual calls them, stray spillets, are human ghosts who you'll find as you explore. These spirits won't attack you, well at least most of them don't attack you, and instead are usually weary, troubled souls that see you, the newly arrived human, on your way to the gates of judgement and ask for your help. They may have lost a photo of a loved one for example and want you to find it for them, or they're simply struggling to come to terms with their death and want someone who'll listen and understand their struggle. Whether or not you choose to actually hear them out is entirely up to you, but I highly recommend doing so because because these interactions were some of my favourite moments in the game. At one point, a spirit notices we've picked up a necklace, insisting it belongs to her. Most players would be inclined to believe her and give it to her straight away, but if you refuse and hold on to the necklace instead, we find its rightful owner much later on, who gets emotional at the thought we might have given it away to the wrong person. <laughs> These interactions with spirits are rare, but that just makes it all the more impactful when they happen. By reading notes scattered around the underworld, we can piece together who these people are and what may have caused their death. And should we so choose, we can help them feel more at ease in the afterlife. After all, the majority of these spirits mean no harm, and while we don't exactly have the power to bring them back to the land of the living, we can at least make their passage to the afterlife that little bit less scary. <laughs> でも、みんな亡くなっちゃった。でも、でももういいの。懐かしいこの曲がまた聞けたから。こんな嬉しい気持ちは久しぶりよ。some of these notes are grim though, some describing murders or violence in very explicit detail. You have to remember that we are, after all, in hell, so everyone you encounter down here must have done something or another to land themselves in the underworld. Some people aren't as bad as others. I think we can all agree that a thief isn't nearly as evil as a serial killer, for example. But the bottom line is that everyone down here is here for a reason, ourselves included. So some spirits may purposefully try to deceive you. They might twist their words, sound more sympathetic, or will turn violent when you refuse to help them, often transforming into a ghost and kicking off a boss fight. You only have notes to go by to connect the dots, but a lot of these notes are very vague or aren't descriptive enough to give you a clear answer, that is, assuming you even find those notes in the first place. So the likelihood of you seeing all of these possible interactions is incredibly low. So low that Hungry Ghost is easily a game that I would say demands three playthroughs minimum to see the majority of what it has to offer, and even then I'd say you're still gonna miss a lot. The likelihood of every single interaction working out in your favour and you finding every key item is incredibly unlikely. Which is actually pretty cool on a first playthrough because you are well and truly going in blind and it's fun to see how you fare without any previous knowledge of what's to come, but man, I would say on a completely blind first playthrough, you're only going to see about 20% of what the game has to offer. That is how much you're thrown into the deep end here. 
Virtually every choice you make can send you on a different trajectory. And naturally, that means even the thought of getting a good ending in Hungry Ghosts is but a pipe dream, unless you're willing to do some rigorous trial and error to figure out the optimal routes. Or you could be a lazy bitch like me and get the guidebook. <laughs> yeah, I'm not normally one for buying guidebooks. I'd be more of a art book or a series history kind of gal, but this was one of the cases where I think a guidebook was mandatory. Not only because the progression in Hungry Goals is incredibly obtuse, but also because there is no information about this game anywhere online. Seriously. <laughs> Both in English and Japanese, I struggled to find guides or wikis or anything that helped me learn more about Hungry Ghosts and its release. Even just basic pointers and explanations for game mechanics were pretty hard to find during my travels. There was some coverage of the game as well as an interview with Tokuro Fujiwara back in June 2003 in the Japanese gaming magazine Weekly Famitsu, issue number 758, but the best I could find of that was this single screenshot. No luck finding an archived version or anything. I'm going to take a guess that it was a pretty low-key release, probably didn't shift that many copies, so naturally there's not much talk about it in Japan, let alone in the West where it didn't even see a release at all. It's one of those rare cases where I just took the L and bought the guidebook to make my life easier. It's also just kind of cool to own a little piece of history like this. Not only does it cover all the more technical things like game mechanics, item descriptions and event lists, but it also lists every single note and what they say. It has an entire walkthrough and an interview with the director, Tokuro Fujiwara himself, at the back. Not only was it a godsend on my playthrough, but it was also just sick to read all the notes I missed out on for more world building and read an interview that, to my knowledge, is nowhere to be found on the internet. And that is why I am not going to translate it for you. Just kidding, obviously, I translated the entire interview with Tokuro Fujiwara into English, link is in the description, you're welcome. Do check it out if you want to learn more about this fascinating, wonderful game that is Hungry Ghosts, but the burning question, is this guidebook going to be enough to get us not only the good ending, but the best ending? There are 15 endings in this game according to the guidebook, only one of which sees you become reincarnated as a human. Not really spoilers because there's not exactly a plot to this game, but that means 14 endings where you stay in hell, so what's involved in getting that elusive best ending? I briefly mentioned earlier that we need to collect spirit fragments throughout the game. You can find these a number of ways. You get a handful automatically in mandatory scenes, but the vast majority are found by interacting with the village of the dead and the people within it. Helping these spirits, and ultimately doing a good deed, grants us a spirit fragment which the ferryman told us would help our chances of reincarnation. To my understanding, there are 20 spirit fragments total in this game, and you need basically every single one to get the best ending. It is nigh impossible to manage this on your own though. Most of them require you to say the right things in conversations or show up at the right place at the right time, one single wrong move and you're locked out forever, goodbye and god bless. I imagine most players probably get one of the worst endings on a first playthrough, but let's use the guide and see what luck we have. Let's do a quick play-by-play -play of what is an optimal playthrough of Hungry Ghosts. In the first major area, there's not anything too crazy to report about. The spirit fragments here are all fairly standard beginner fare to get you used to the game more than anything. You meet a hanging man, an apparition living down a well, and most importantly, you meet a spirit called Linda. If there's any plot to be had in Hungry Ghosts, then this is it. Linda sees a brooch we picked up earlier on and realizes she's forgotten something very important to her. She asks us to help her remember and gives us the choice of either a letter or a photo of her. Picking the photo here is crucial to continuing her story, so let's take that. Worth pointing out that there are two kinds of notes you can pick up in this game, regular notes and purple ones called accounts. These are far more important and usually give you vital information that will help you get spirit fragments, so picking them up is a must whenever you find them. We meet a spirit later in the guillotine area called Alan who notices we're holding on to the photo of Linda. He says that she is his fiancée and that photo was taken when they went to their special place. She's waiting for him in her special place? After this, he drops a photo of himself that we take with us and the next time we meet Linda, she tells us about that special place. It was a gorgeous field of flowers and it was there that an otherworldly voice spoke to them both, telling them the true pleasures of life. You can either disagree with her view or say Alan said the same thing. It's here that we meet a young girl who tells us that she'll also meet us there, but it's strange that neither Linda nor Alan ever mention this girl. We eventually make it to that special place, a beautiful, colourful flower bed that is a striking contrast to the game's consistently grim environments. Before disappearing, Linda tells us that if we were able to find this place, it surely means that we also understand those same pleasures of life. 
The girl shows up again and tells us that she has the power to bring us to heaven instead, saving us from our impending judgement. And while many players might be tempted by this, you have to say no, because doing so reveals that she was actually a vicious ghost in disguise trying to trick you. This ghost is also quite possibly the hardest boss in the game. This guy is absolutely brutal and can overwhelm you very easily, but once you beat him, you can move on to the final stretch of Hungry Ghosts. Here is where you can do something very interesting. Before moving on to the Gates of Judgement, you can willingly throw yourself down to the Graveyard to Hell that I mentioned earlier. In a small hidden area, we can find gravestones of all the spirits we met throughout the game, both of those we helped and those we ended up fighting. And here is where you get the last spirit fragment, only if you did everything correct up until now, thus fulfilling the requirements for the best ending. Finally, we find ourselves at the Gates of Judgement, which acknowledge that we have achieved great things on our way here, but it is ultimately our destiny to go to hell, which triggers the final boss fight. And this boss is really visually stunning, but oh my god, it just takes so long, dude. <laughs> he is such a sponge for attacks, and even using the best equipment in the game, this fight took me almost 15 minutes. I am not joking. He also throws out items and weapons every so often for you to use, but I was way too paranoid that it might affect the ending, so I didn't take any of them. If you can actually take those and it doesn't affect the ending, then that's great. It's still a very drawn out fight, though. Finally, after that's over, you get assessed on how you played the game, and this part is really cool. It outlines your playstyle and how often you gave in to the so-called temptations of hell, giving one final summary, which in my case said that I had a strong sense of agency and decisiveness, but I was very self-righteous and so haven't really changed all that much in my time here after all acting much the same as I did as a warrior during my life, so while I haven't managed to change my fate, I would be granted an important role in the underworld that requires an equal amount of decision-making and self-righteousness to suit my personality. The role of a Grim Reaper, a god of death. Ending A. Damn. <laughs> okay, well that didn't work. So the reason I got this ending is because not only do you need to collect as many spirit fragments as possible, but also you need to keep in mind the game's desire system. Not only are you judged on how much you interact with the world, but also on three criteria. Your desire of destruction, which is how often you destroy things and kill ghosts. The desire of materialism, so how often you pick up items, weapons, healing items, basically just being gluttonous. And the desire of reliance, which is kind of the most ambiguous of the three, but to my understanding it's more or less how often you pick up notes and how often you rely on protection items. Now, of course, you kind of have to do all of these things, so your desires going up are natural and an intended part of the game, but you need to have the combined number of your desires below 20,000 by the ending. Mine was unfortunately in the 30,000-ish range, which is why I ended up with the second best ending, ending A, despite otherwise doing everything correctly. There are events you can trigger though that purposefully lower your desires for you and make the endings much easier to get, and I was able to pull off all of these events except for one, the one that I needed the most. I kept finding my desire of reliance was really high at the end of my playthrough, so anything that would help me reduce that was desperately needed, and apparently placing an item called the Tooth of God on this little pedestal here would do exactly that, <laughs> but it never worked. I had the tooth in my inventory and it just wouldn't let me do anything, and I kept getting the A ending, and it was starting to piss me off because it's all that's stopping me from the S ending, but turns out I was trying to put the wrong tooth there every time. I was trying to put the muddy tooth there instead because my goofy ass can't read. The real kicker is the tooth of God is given to you in literally the first room of the game, but I was always too preoccupied rushing through this room to ever notice. What I was convinced was a bug was just me being illiterate, and thankfully once I rectified this, I got the S ending no problem. But you aren't really missing much in the S ending, and truth be told, for the amount of effort you have to put in to get it, it's not really worth it. And to be honest, I kind of think that's the point. The real joy of Hungry Ghosts is exploring the village of the dead, learning more about the people and their stories, and navigating the underworld on your terms. It's a world where half the fun is exploring it naturally. So while the endings do feel a little bit underwhelming, I think it's because the focus is on the journey and not the destination. As for the desire system, while it can be a thorn in your side while going for the endings, I love the creativity behind it. By far, Hungry Ghost takes the vast majority of its inspiration and content 
concepts from Buddhism. And while I am by no means claiming to be super knowledgeable about this religion, after some research I couldn't help but notice some core Buddhist beliefs being reflected in this game. Karma, cause and effect, and the concept of fate, all of which are very core ideas to Buddhism and many Eastern belief systems, are name dropped very often in Hungry Ghost. Characters even directly comment on meeting you, saying they feel it was fate that you both crossed paths. Buddhism champions the idea that your actions influence your future, you know, like good karma and bad karma, and therefore we all have a hand in shaping our own destiny. And well, this ideology also perfectly describes Hungry Ghost design, doesn't it? You landed in hell thanks to past karma of being a warrior who murdered many people, but even in death you have the chance to redeem yourself, to influence your destiny and make amends, though it is, of course, no easy task. Much like it's difficult in real life, it's difficult to achieve in the game thanks to all of the needlessly specific requirements to get a good ending. And while Hungry Ghost difficulty may be exactly what would push someone away from playing it, I have to commend it for its dedication to representing Buddhist ideals in such a creative and accessible way, a hands-on experience of those religious beliefs in a format only a video game can offer. Even the name, Hungry Ghosts, is yet another Buddhist concept. They're ghosts that are driven by desires that can never be satisfied, most typically that of hunger or thirst, hence the name. In fact, there's entire festivals in many Asian countries dedicated to sating the desires of these ghosts, often involving leaving food out for them and therefore warding off bad luck. And we see this in virtually every enemy encounter in the game. Ghouls often steal any apples you have in your inventory, whereas ghosts bargain with you to hand over your food items. This purposeful design choice of taking a real religious concept and translating it into a video game mechanic is, in my opinion, nothing short of genius. And especially as a Westerner, I learned so much about concepts and beliefs that, frankly, I rarely encounter on my day-to-day -day basis. But what was probably the most eye-opening thing I experienced in Hungry Ghost was how directly it deals with death as a concept. Generally speaking, the Western world fears death far more than Eastern cultures. Think of the Grim Reaper, the personification of death, a creature that is seen as evil and malicious who takes people to the afterlife before their time. The closest to a Grim Reaper in Japanese culture, the Shinigami, doesn't have that negative connotation as much. They are simply the ones who begin the process of moving on to the afterlife. They're doing their job. Death is just another part of the life cycle and, if anything, it's believed that it brings perspective and wisdom and should be used as a motivator to live each day to the fullest. So while there are 15 endings in Hungry Ghosts, none of them feel superior to the other. To us as Westerners, being reincarnated as a human may appear as the most ideal outcome, but there's nothing about that ending in Hungry Ghosts that makes you feel like, hell yeah, that's it, I won the game. You know when you play another game and you get the best ending and it feels like the best ending? That isn't the case here. It's no more or less fleshed out than the other 14 endings, which makes me think then that there is no best ending. It's the S ending because it takes the most effort, not because it is objectively the best. And it turns out this theory of mine is right, because in Tokuro Fujiwara's closing comments in the guidebook interview, he says, The majority of modern video games conform to the idea that everyone should aim for the same good ending and figure out how to play the game correctly to achieve that. So Hungry Ghost is very much an antithesis to that rigid kind of game design. Adding, The original concept of Hungry Ghost was, you're going to end up as a ghost either way, so you should decide what kind of ghost you'll be. And that's why I think you should just play the game and find out what ending you get naturally. Just try your best and see where you end up. Let it take its course and see where it lands you. Almost kind of like life itself, isn't it? And I <laughs> didn't think this video would go in such a philosophical direction, but you know, I'm just, all I'm saying is maybe there's something we can take from this, you know? Maybe it wouldn't hurt to think more like that, you know? All I'm trying to say is experiencing a different mentality, a different approach, was really refreshing and I sincerely feel like I learned something in playing Hungry Ghosts. There's so much to dig into in this game and not only is it incredibly unique in its themes and concepts, but also in its design. How you play, how every action matters, it's a perfect example of an experimental and weird approach to video game design and a level of creativity that I sincerely struggle to find in the modern age of video games. And it's exactly why I wanted to start this sub-series on my channel where I'll specifically be exploring Japan-only gems that, somewhat tragically, never see the light of day in the Western world because, believe me, <laughs> there is a lot of them. We don't even know the half of it.
but unfortunately Hungry Ghost is definitely on the more challenging side when it comes to language. If you happen to be a Japanese language learner, I would only recommend playing this if you have at least an advanced level of Japanese. Not only do the characters speak in riddles and are written to be intentionally vague, but they also speak in the Japanese equivalent of ye olde English sometimes, so if you're a new learner to the language and think this might be a good way to jump in and test your ability, it might just scare you off instead. And as of right now, there's no English translation patch for this game. Yet, anyway, there actually is one in the works. A group of lovely folks are working on translating the entire game and I'm helping out with the project whenever I can. I can't give you any kind of ETA, it'll be ready when it's ready, but do feel free to follow the project on its Twitter here and I'll also be posting updates on my own personal Twitter as well. Do watch the space. This is definitely a game you're going to want to try when it's ready. You know, it almost feels like Hungry Ghost was too ahead of its time, to be honest. Challenging gameplay with a dark gothic aesthetic that is literally the Souls franchise nowadays and look at how popular they are. So hopefully this translation patch can bring Hungry Ghosts a new lease of life outside of Japan, 20 years after its initial release. If you're willing to try out a more unconventional, challenging, but very rewarding game, Hungry Ghosts is the game for you. And I'm not normally one for difficult games, I'm much more of a play the game for the story kind of person, but after my first playthrough I was eager to jump right back in and try out different routes and see what I missed. It's an experience that demands multiple playthroughs to soak it all in, but hey, even if that isn't your vibe, the world and its design alone is worth the price of entry. There are sincerely not many games out there like it, and hey, it's not all Often I can say a game opened my eyes to new perspectives and ways of thinking. So you know what? Fair play, Hungry Ghosts. You did good. Hi! Thank you so much for watching. This marks the beginning of a sub-series of sorts where I'll be covering Japanese gems that never made it to the West, so I hope Hungry Ghost was an interesting enough first entry. If you like what I do, feel free to subscribe and hit that bell and all that, and also check me out over on Twitch or Twitter for streams, content updates, blah blah blah. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time!